festival named in his honor. William Moderand was born here in the small southeastern Kansas community a little over a century ago, in 1913, and he grew up here. He became one of Amer he became one of America's greatest players. His will always be remembered in America's literary and theatrical uh, history because of five major works that have endured. They were all made first as plays, produced in New York on Broadway, and then, fortuitously, they were sold to movies, and all the movies made from them were very successful movies. And that's how I had my first encounter with William Inns at the Star Theater in Lyons, Kansas, where Comeback Little Sheba was playing, and Shirley uh, Booth and Burt Lancaster were starring in it. I didn't know then that Burt Lancaster was too young to play Doc. Mm -hmm. I just uh, thought Shirley Booth was kind of a nattering and bothersome uh, in the role. <laughs> but the, my point is that the movies made Inge accessible mm -hmm. all over the country to folks who otherwise wouldn't have ever gone to New York to see a play on Broadway. Come Back Little Sheba was the first of his successful plays. It was in New York on Broadway in 1950, and then the movie, also starring Shirley Booth, who had been in the role on Broadway. Um, and that movie came out in 1952. The second play, second consecutive play to be a success, was Picnic. It was such a big success in New York that it won a Pulitzer Prize for William Inge. And it was made into a movie filmed near my hometown, Lyons, Kansas, in the middle of the state, back in the mid-50s, with exciting people like William Holden, Rosalind Russell, and especially in my young point of view, Kim Novak, <laughs> some of the most important roles. That movie came to theaters in 1956. His third play in a row to be a success in New York was Bus Stop in 1955. It was filmed and starred Marilyn Monroe and John Murray. And that film came out in 1956. A fourth consecutive play that was a hit in New York, somewhat autobiographical play set in a town that was supposedly in Oklahoma, but sounded an awful lot like Southeast Kansas. That play was The Dark at the Top of the Stairs, a success on Broadway in 1957, and then made into another very successful film in 1960, starring Robert Preston and Dorothy McGuire, and Eve Arden, and special and close to my heart, a hometown girl from Lyons, Kansas, named Shirley Knight, who went on to a very successful career as an actor. <clears throat> if that weren't enough, William Minge then wrote an original screenplay <clears throat> called Splendor in the Grass, the title and allusion to the wonderful poem, a long poem by William Wordsworth, called The Intimation Code. Nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass of glory in the flower. And the rest of that line, but we will grieve not, rather find strength in that which remains behind, is more or less the story of William Inge's life. Accepting what had happened in his life and in his <clears throat> career, the ups and downs of being uh, who he was, from where he was, but those five words cemented his reputation. And if all that weren't enough, he won an Academy Award in 1961 for the best original screenplay. So, the answer to my question, how many small Kansas towns can claim a native son who created five enduring major works, who won a Pulitzer Prize and an Academy? So Inge is important in the cultural history of America because he has the reputation 
richly deserved of being America's first authentic Midwestern playwright. And because he won that Pulitzer Prize and that Academy Award. And because his plays became popular films, directed by some of America's most famous stage and screen directors, and starring some of America's most famous stage and screen actors and actresses. Now, biographical information, Inge grew to young adulthood here in Independence, attending Independence Public School. <coughs> he acted in local high school productions directed by Anna Engelman, a dedicated theater teacher who is famous in the annals of this community. He aspired to a career in acting, a pursuit he continued at the University of Kansas after he graduated from Independence High School in 1930. Except for a brief time attending Independence Community College, he returned to KU, uh, University of Kansas, where he graduated in 1935. He earned a master's degree from George Peabody College in Nashville, Tennessee in 1938. He decided against trying an acting career, briefly taught high school in Columbus, Kansas. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Inch Collection here is they have a copy of his original teaching contract signed for the year he taught high school in Columbus, Kansas. I think his salary was $1,500. It was uh, 1936, 37 school year. He taught at Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri, and then after a brief stint as a cultural critic at the New St. Louis Star-Times newspaper, he taught at Washington University in St. Louis. Inge didn't enjoy teaching. He always claimed that he was not very good at it, but there's some evidence from people who were his students that they thought otherwise. But that was not what he wanted to do. He was a little bit at loose ends. He had a bit of a drinking problem. But when he was the cultural critic for the paper in St. Louis, he was advised that there was a young playwright coming to town who was going to have a play, his first play mounted soon in Chicago, where it would be a success it would go on in New York. And he was visiting in St. Louis to see his mom. His name was Thomas Lanier Williams, better known now as Tennessee. And William Inge interviewed to do a kind of hometown has hometown boy has play coming out, you know. And they became good friends. And Inge traveled to Chicago saw the Glass Menagerie, which was that first play of Tennessee Williams, and was absolutely dazzled. And he confessed to his friends afterward, said, you know, I see so many plays here in St. Louis, and I really don't think they're all that good. I think I could write a better play than what I just saw. And Tennessee Williams said, well, why don't you write plays? And so he decided he would. Now, if you know Tennessee Williams' is the, the Glass Menagerie, you know that it's really about the Williams family. Well, William Inge's first play was called Farther Off from Heaven. And oddly enough, it was about the Inge family of Independence, Kansas. And it was produced down in Dallas, Texas in 1947. Through Tennessee Williams and that friendship, Inge developed theater contacts in New York and in Dallas where uh, Margot Jones was mounting a brand new regional theater. And those contacts became very important. He also uh, was put into a, a business relationship with the woman who was Tennessee Williams' agent in New York City. Audrey Wood, who later became a very famous agent, and was one of the founders of International Creative Management, which uh, ICM, which 
uh, was later to be a, a, a huge kind of conglomerate agency. But Inge had a really good agent in New York. So you can imagine his disappointment when that really good agent in New York said she didn't think that first play, Farther Off in Heaven, was really what she could sell to potential producers. Inge was heartbroken about this. He really hated the idea of going back to teaching. And um, so he was sort of despondent, but he started working with an idea he had about this couple that uh, he more or less was thinking about uh, a disappointing marriage, two disillusioned people, but they make their lives together work somehow, in spite of everything. And that's what became Comeback of the Sheep. He showed it to Williams, and Williams liked it, and so he encouraged him to send this one to New York to Audrey Hill. And that, of course, was Comeback of the Sheep, and that was the first successful play. Once he was successful and rat rattled off those four consecutive Broadway hits. Fame and fortune came to William Lynch, and it reflected very favorably on his hometown in the Midwest. He brought a subject matter to Broadway that wasn't really familiar to the theater uh, going public and critics at that time. And he got a real slice of life in the Midwest 1950s style. And that really established a kind of new subject matter of great interest in American theater. And all of those plays that I mentioned are still produced today. Over a half century past, well over a half century past. I, I have a, per, a personal theory that Picnic has been produced in every city in America large and small, that has a community theater group. It's, a, it's an ensemble cast. Generally, the sexuality is muted. Uh, even in some productions, Hal, one of the main uh, character, romantic character, keeps his shirt on in some communities. But a couple of years ago, there was a revival in New York. Hal definitely had his shirt off. <laughs> so we are talking about works that endure. It's a little unfortunate because Inge was not a particularly happy, uh, fulfilled feeling person when he had all this fame and success. Pulitzer Prize, sold the rights to the movie. He should have been deliriously happy. But when he published his collection of four plays by William Inge, um, he wrote a preface in which he said, I just had always thought as a young man that success would make me deliriously happy. But it didn't particularly. And there are very, very compelling reasons why that's true. One of those reasons, not talked about much in the 1950s, but more familiar to us today, is that Inge was homosexual. It wasn't just considered immoral in the 50s, it was illegal. And a lot of very, very creative people, uh, while their artistic talent may have flourished and brought them great success like Inge's, their personal sense of who they were and why they were the way they were and so on. Uh, was not satisfied. And Inge did go into psychoanalysis. He struggled with his alcoholism. He was a man who was somewhat troubled by all of this. And it was reflected uh, in the way he lived his life. He was publicly well known, but he was a very private person. And that was a contributing factor to the way he experienced his own success. But as I said, 
He had all of those successes. That's why we have the festival. And it's a, a part of the story is the acceptance of this community as its native son. There may have been some hesitancy, some people who saw, say, a play like Picnic, in which the, the, the town's young beauty queen runs off uh, with the drifter, uh, shiftless, but handsome guy, coming to town. Uh, that, that didn't speak well somehow to the community. There were those who knew about Andrew's private life, and so they felt that they couldn't approve his work because they couldn't approve of him and the way he lived his life. What they probably didn't know and appreciate was how tortured he often felt about his situation. Nonetheless, the fact that he was successful gave him something to hold on to. That no matter what his personal life was like, he was validated by that success. People did like what he wrote. People cared about what he was able to produce and give to the world. And that sustained him, and made him strong enough to continue as a writer. Unfortunately, time and taste change. Critics who used to love your work decide that you're not doing good work anymore. And Inge ran into that. It was like a buzzsaw. Williams, his friend, ran into it too. The problem was, well, you know, when you set a high standard for yourself, people expect you to do the same thing every time out. Right four hit plays in a row. People start asking you, where's number five? Tennessee Williams was constantly being held in his own standard. He had a wonderful play called Summer and Smoke. When it went to Broadway, Streetcar Named Desire was still on down the street. So when Summer and Smoke appeared, the critics said, well, it's too much like Streetcar. He's not doing anything new. And yet, if you know Summer and Smoke, you know it's a wonderful play. So sometimes you can be it's like the critics have to say something, so they decide, well, it's good, but it's not up to the thing. And Inge got that from the critics. Unfortunately, after the success of Splendor in the Grass, Inge's career pretty much went off track. Not so much because he didn't have anything more to say, but because audiences and critics decided that they didn't particularly like any more of Inge's plays about people from Kansas and Oklahoma. He did movie scripts, one of which I think was very good. It was an adaptation of James Leo Hurley's novel, All Fall Down, in 1962. Well done film, not very successful. Then he worked, uh, he took a one act play that he had called Bus Riley's Back in Town, worked it up into a screenplay. It was made as a film. He was not consulted with changing because, you know, if you're out in Hollywood and you're a writer, you're the last person that they ask once you produce the script. He didn't recognize the movie that resulted from his script. So he had his name taken off the credits. That's how bad it was in terms of how he thought that movie should have been made, and what that story should have been. So if you look at one of these movie posters, which here in the collection were donated by uh, Art McClure, who was a history professor over at Central Missouri State, yes, over in uh, Warrensburg, Missouri, you'll see for the poster on Bus Riley's Back in Town that the screenplay is credited to a man named Walter Gage. There was never any such person. That's because he had his name taken off of it. Uh, so he was disappointed. And he, the 
sort of like in a box and he couldn't write his way out of it. He had three more plays on Broadway, A Loss of Roses in 1959, Natural Affection in 1963, and Where's Daddy in 1966. None of these plays attracted audience. Critics were very rough on them. In fact, one critic wrote after seeing Where's Daddy that I don't care where Daddy is, I want to know where William Inns is. It was in a sort of gratuitous and unnecessary there and cutting kind of commentary. Inns' lack of success led him to severe depression, drug abuse. He did write two novels near the end of his career. One of them was called Good Luck, Miss Wyckoff, about a lonely school teacher in a small Kansas town that he called Freedom. Get it? Freedom. <laughs> Not independent. Freedom. That story is an attempt to be sensational and largely not very successful. That was published in 1970. In 1971, he published a memoir that was fiction, but he called it a memoir of a young, uh, once young writer named Joey Hansen, who had a career mostly as a school teacher and wrote some poetry that had some success, but in the long run and in the short run, he just, either way, didn't feel like his life had been very successful. It's a very touching book, and I was assured by members of the Inch family that it's pretty much an autobiographical novel, very thinly disguised as a memoir of someone else. Also set in freedom, Kansas. <laughs> I would urge of those two novels that you read, My Son is a Splendid Driver. Very touching. I would call it the autobiography of Inge's creative sensibility. He was in and out of hospitals the last few days of his life checked in, and then checked himself out against medical advice, and he took his own life when he was only 60 years old, mm -hmm. on June 10th, 1973. He's buried here in Independence. In the Inge family plot, his personalized tombstone adds to his name the single additional word. For those of you who would like to read a very short summary and not read this long, Art McClure of Central Missouri, who gave us these movie posters, has written a, has written a short piece called The Midwestern World of William Inge, and copies are readily available around town, and uh, it gives you thumbnail kind of sketch of his life and his contribution. I'll tell you a little bit about this collection and my work. The collection itself began in 1965 when Inge donated some of his own manuscripts. Now, it isn't that he necessarily wanted to enshrine himself in his hometown. It's more like, as I understood it from some family members, he was always very keen to find ways to write off taxes. <laughs> and so he would put a value on the manuscript uh, and then write it off after he donated it. Uh, by the way, he also was quite a collector of modern art, sculpture, and painting. He owned uh, paint by who am I going to Pollock. He owned paintings by Pollock before Pollock was Pollock. Uh, so they appreciated very uh, sharply. And he donated those to museums. 
got that tax right on <laughs> but it. But what it, uh, and then the result of that is that the Nelsons, for example, uh, in Kansas City had some, some of his art collection. He was a very astute collector. Um, he was a Rodin sculptor. And um, he, he had a very fine taste. And so when he started the Inch Collection by donating manuscripts, uh, I'm sure in 1965 he didn't quite realize how it would grow and how astonishingly, if he could know today that there is a festival in this town named after him and honoring he would be he would be very pleased, and he would also be, I think, stricken with a kind of sense of wonder that such a thing had happened. Now, over the years, material came into the collection from several other sources, uh, including his agency, ICM, Professor McClure of Central uh, Missouri State, donating movie posters. Inge family members have donated manuscripts and works of modern art. Collectors of Inge's letters donated some of his letters. There are also many photographs. Some of the photographs are in this display case right below me here that I would invite you to look at in my presentation of Kenneth. Pictures of Inge as a young man. Copies of manuscripts drawings that he made, a copy of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof signed by his friend Tennessee Williams. These are in addition, you see the bookcases. His sister Helene gave his book collection to the Inge collection and it's all a little over 1600 volumes. If you look at these spines, you'll see what a well-read man he was. And his interests ranged, I noticed just over here at the sampling, you've got Plato, Greek philosophy. Over here, you've got <coughs> murder mysteries, John Toland, Dillinger Day. A, a very touching, what I thought was a very touching spine. The sexual offender and his offenses. Right beside the Dalton brothers, the famous outlaws. You know. Over here, books on religion, mysticism, production books of Dark at the Top of the Stairs, one of the plays. In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, you know. another one of my interests. You know. There are over a hundred uh, manuscripts that came in to go with the 100 or 400 manuscripts that were already here. Record collections, critical and biographical sources, films that were made from his work, a great many audio tapes with, of interviews with people who knew him that were very, very helpful to me uh, when I worked on my biography. There are a couple of audio tapes that, to it, uh, it, that feature Inge's voice, his own voice. He had a very deep, rich kind of baritone, and he was quite a good reader of his own plays. In 1983, I had a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to come here and study this collection. It was just being cataloged at the time I was working on it. I was right at this table, sitting on the end there, and Bill Fonenstale, who was assisting Gene de Grusen from Pittsburgh State University uh, to curate, opened the boxes of things, cataloged them, and it was lucky that I was here at that time because uh, Gene or, or Mr. Fonenstiel would give me 
things that they found in a box that they thought I'd really be interested in. And I, I'll have a little bit more uh, to, to add about that shortly. But the memorabilia that's here, about the Inge family and Inge's interest, his record collection, uh, he loved to listen to classical music. Um, all testimony to someone who was born and raised here, forged his artistic sensibilities here, and who went on to become a very, very successful creative uh, artist in his own right, but also a very well-read, very intelligent, and very, very insightful human being. It gave all of us something lasting in his creation. William Inge's dad was a traveling salesman. One of the things he had in common with Kenneth E. Lee. They must have swapped some interesting notes about their traveling salesman father. <laughs> One of the more interesting things here in the Inge collection is over in this corner there's this really badly battered old sample case. His father worked for the Wheeler and Modern dry goods company out of St. Louis. And in fact, that's why William Inge's middle name is Mark. It was one of his dad's bosses. <laughs> this sample case belonged to Luther Clayton Inge, Inge's father. And he dragged it all over the Indian territory, which is what you and I know of Oklahoma, selling uh, Wheeler and Modern dry goods. Also here in the collection, <clears throat> these movie posters, which I love because this is the way I first found out about William Inge. When I, when I heard that the guy who wrote Picnic was from Kansas, I got very proud because I'm from Kansas. In fact, I graduated from high school at a place called Plainville, Kansas. People tell me they don't believe that. They think I made it up. It's just too appropriate. But, but it's the truth. <laughs> Come back, little Sheba. Picnic, which was filmed near, as I said, my hometown. Here are William Holden and Kim Novak dancing in Halstead, Kansas, where they have in their local town museum the kind of paper mache swan boat that that Marge Kim Novak comes floating down the local town, town creek. This is a picture of several people at the picnic, shot by uh, the Saline River in the park in Salina, Kansas, <clears throat> and that's interesting in a way because in the movie of Picnic there really is a picnic. In the play picnic, there is no picnic. It's off stage. Um, and everything happens in, uh, in the backyard single set that was designed by Joe Milesner. By the way, Joe Milesner was one of the most important set designers in the history of American theater. And he did sets for Inge's play. The movie version of Bus Stop, How Can You Miss Marilyn Monroe? I assure you that in the mid-50s, I didn't miss it. <laughs> With Don Murray, directed by Joshua Logan, who, by the way, also directed Picnic, and Inge and Logan did not get along very well. But by the time the movie was made, if you've ever seen the movie of Bus Stop, it's not set in Kansas, it's set in Arizona. And the one character who has a lot in common with William Inge, Dr. Lyman, the itinerant, drunken professor who's just riding a bus, does not appear in the movie at all. But it was a big cinemascope, splendid movie, particularly if you were not familiar with the play. The dock at the top of the stairs, which features a young little boy who collects movie pictures of movie stars. Sonny Flood is very much like William Inge was when he was a young boy growing up here. And that's interesting uh, 
the French movie poster for Dark at the uh, Top of the Stairs. Here's Splendor in the Grass with Warren Beatty and Natalie Wood. By the way, that was Warren Beatty's first film. It was directed by Elia Kazan. Warren Beatty's first role on Broadway was in William Inge's The Loss of Rose in 1959. And Inge urged Elia Kazan to cast Warren Beatty as Bud Stamper in Splendor in the Grass. It worked out very well for Inge, for Elia Kazan, and especially well for Warren Beatty. There was a fairly forgettable movie called The Stripper, starring um, uh, Joanne Woodward, that was based on The Loss of Rose. But pretty much a forgettable movie. And there's a poster for All Fall Down. Uh, which I, as I said, I think is a pretty good film. Now I just want to call your attention, and this is the part where I'm moving around a little bit. There are several pictures of Inge himself on the walls, and this is one of the standard ones that's been used a lot uh, with the programs for this festival. An example of Inge's art that he collected. Over here on the wall, the Peabody Reflector is the alumni magazine of Peabody College in Nashville. And playwright Bill End was featured in the March and April 1956 edition. What I want to point out here, I think is very one of the great things in the collection. The trustees of Columbia University in the city of New York award William Inge the Pulitzer Prize. That notice is framed here. Right behind these ladies here, the pictures of William Inge as a young man, beginning with a, a baby picture in the upper left, and then at the bottom right, and immediately to the left of it, high school pictures. But as you can see, he was a very handsome young man, nice head of hair. I remember hair. <laughs> <laughs> Inge loved to sketch. He had some artistic ability of his own. When he was a younger man, he sketched some of the movie stars that he most admired. And if you look over here at this display, you see some performers who are probably not at all known to young people today. But they were very popular when Inge was a young man. Is that Basil Rathbone? That is Basil Rathbone and Tallulah Bankhead to the left. Joan Crawford down in the lower right corner. Agnes Moorhead upper left. I'm not sure about the other two. Um, but you see he had a real gift. Uh, but he just didn't pursue that. You also see in this one drawing that he might have had a sort of inclination toward modern art. Uh, because that looks a little more like uh, Picasso. The catalog... The old-fashioned card catalog over here lists all of the holdings of the collection. When I got that NEH grant and spent a month here in Independence, this was my center of operation. I went out into the community and I did interview some local folks, many of them who at that time in the early 80s uh, were contemporaries. So they knew William Inge, and they had stories to tell about him growing up here. Mostly interesting stories, like one of his neighbors, a woman named uh, Helen Clement, who said, you know, we lived about a block away from the Inge's, and they lived over here in the, the, the house that you had to see the print up there that went over on 4th Street, and she said, 
Every day he would walk to and from school and he was so earnest. <laughs> he was just going to school. And she remembered that very indelibly. <coughs> Her husband, John Clement, remembered that they had one of these, apparently it was done a lot uh, back, back then. Young men would dress up like women and they would sort of do a mock chorus line presentation. John Clement was like the quarterback on the football team, but he was a part of, a, of one of those burlesque groups. And there's a picture of them all over here in, uh, in this tape of all the young men, and they're, in, they're striking this pose. <laughs> and it's hilarious. <laughs> I mentioned a while ago that I had a lot of help in spotting things that were here. And some of these things that, that were brought to my attention touched me very much because I was getting to know who this man was. And I knew, for example, how important his mother was in his whole life. And I'm sure that his mother was very proud of him. But he didn't come back to visit very much. But he would always write these sort of like non-committal, not very deep, warm letters. And this is a letter that he wrote to his mother. Well, I call it a letter. It's one paragraph. <laughs> it's dated Saturday, November 14th. And it must have been shortly after the sale of the film rights to Pickney. Because this is what he wrote. Dear Mom, just got your nice letter. Sorry not to have written sooner. No, I haven't been sick or anything. I've been busy and maybe just careless about writing. But I think of you just the same. Yes, I sold Picnic to the movies for a nice big sum of money. Doesn't that make you happy? The money will be paid to me over a period of years, and I'll get a little at a time. You take care of yourself now like a good girl, and I'll be home to see you as soon as I can. I defy you to find anything of much meaning there, except <laughs> that maybe he's letting Mom know he doesn't have a whole lot of extra money to give. <laughs> when you look at this, you'll see that something's been cut at an odd angle out of the bottom of the station. And I have a secret suspicion that his sister Helene or someone close to him clipped that because there was something handwritten there that she didn't want published. I don't want to say anything bad about Helene, his sister, because she was very helpful to me. If you see this very nice display out here in the hallway, that they made. I think the creator, right back there in the corner, uh, it reflects a lot of my work. Uh, you'll know that you'll see some of the help that Helene Connell did give me. But she was protective of her brother. And she did not want it widely known that he was gay until other people were saying it and it became better known. But she, you know, there was just, you know, there was this attitude and protective feeling that she had. She loved her brother very much. But sadly, she's the one who was living with him in his last days when she found him when he committed suicide. But there is that. And <clears throat> I think probably the thing that touched me the most was when I was here doing my research, Bill Bonnensteel brought me a letter one day and he said, I know you're going to want to look at this. Margaret Goheen, who was one of the founders of this festival, and a man named Neil Ed, who at the time was the president of Independence Community College, had written to him and said, we're building a new campus and we're going to have a theater. 
we'd like to know if it's all right with you if we named it the William Lynch Theater. The letter that Bill Fonenstiel brought me was in just a reply, which if you'll bear with me, I want to read to you. You have bestowed an honor upon me I never could have expected. It is very warming to know that my hometown's people think enough of me to want to name your theater center for me. It's certainly an honor, but also a responsibility which I feel I must consider carefully, out of respect for you rather than for myself. I am, after all, only 55 years old. Old enough, but young for some writing. And I may have my most important work yet before me. And of course, I may not. I can't help wondering what the civic feeling would be should I write a play or a novel that the townspeople strongly disapprove of. And what if something should happen in my personal life that would make my name an embarrassment to the college? Please understand, I'm not planning on any of these things happening, but one never knows. Usually buildings are named after people after they're dead. I've always considered this custom to be a useless one, and I've always argued that we as a nation should pay more honor to artists and writers when they're living. <clears throat> now I see the hazard of the practice. Dead people are much safer to honor than they live. Mm -hmm. He knew what the people in town might have thought. He wrote certain things, and they were performed and published that might reflect very negatively not only on him, but on this community. And he did not want that to happen. Because at the bottom of everything, you know you can't write. You can't write about a place without loving it the way he did. You can't. Any questions? Thank you so much. Sure. My friend is and not familiar with any of this, and I know she's internalizing it, and uh, okay. you are indeed the person to talk about mm -hmm. for the minute. Well, I don't get tired of it, but as no. you can see, I get a little emotional. Well, that's part of the important. Well, mm -hmm. that's very kind of you to say. Goodness gracious. <laughs> um, there's so much more to know about William Inge, but it, it's, the best way is to read those five, That's right. or go down and rent the movies, because they're not bad movies, even Bus Stop, without uh, Professor <laughs> Lyman, is very entertaining. Uh -huh. Yeah. There was a group of American writers, fiction writers, back mostly in the 1920s. And they wrote about small towns in the Midwest. And they were very successful, but none of them was a playwright. I'm talking about writers like Sherwood Anderson, whose Winesburg, Ohio is a classic work of American mm -hmm. literature. And uh, the man from Salt Center, Minnesota, which is even smaller than Independence, Sinclair Lewis, who wrote Main Street. They are the important writers that Inge has a kinship with. They're taken as a group, these writers, one of whom, by the way, was Edgar Watson Howe of Kansas, were called the writers of the revolt from the village. And there were, there were poets, too, like Edgar Lee Masters, um, who was born in Garnett, Kansas, but wrote about 
uh, a little town, Boone River and Falling, mm -hmm. in, in the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. These revolt from the village peoples all had a village background, and they all had to go to the metropolitan areas and think about their roots, but they wrote very compellingly. Another such writer was Willa Cather, mm -hmm. who spent formative years in tiny Red Cloud, Nebraska, which is also smaller <laughs> than in the day. Mm -hmm. They are wor writers worth knowing, and they have a strong literary contribution to the history of literary art in, in America. Inge had a lot of success in the theater world, productions of his plays. If you read those plays as literature, like much like we often read Shakespeare, and study Shakespeare, you'll really learn something about small towns, their values, and the people in them that, like I say, you can't produce that kind of work. You might go off to the city and you might run the risk of upsetting some of the local folks, but you're going to tell the truth about how that experience registered on your sensibilities. And William Inns certainly fills that need. And he's the only playwright that has done that. The others are fiction writers mostly. I guess I'm through. There are no questions, but I'm going to be around here for the duration of the festival, and I'll be here again Sunday afternoon. So if you think of something you want to ask me or talk to me about, I'm going to be around. I'd love to talk to you. Thank you. And if anybody's interested, we do have um, coffee and tea and hot chocolate available. And do browse around in here and look at some of these displays. It's very interesting. I had to clean this place. <laughs> I used to work in the library here and cleaning all of the books and everything. It's very oh, wow. interesting. Wow. Yeah, very well done. Mm. So now you know. I do. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Yes, I enjoy. enjoy. I'm over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. God bless you. He does. <laughs> <laughs>